All right. Connie, you, could you please raise your hand? She's in the back. Okay, good. Thank you. you want to start? Yeah, we started. No, we can go through here. Go. So, um, I would say the best thing for you is to stand to the side a little bit. Like, let me show you. So you can be oriented. So you need to come this way. So there's a little bit more room for people to come through. Right. You have a little vision, right? A little, yeah. So if somebody's coming in from this side, can you, can you see me towards you? Yes. Can you chat? So you'll need to reach out and stop people for, before they run into the microphone. Right. Okay. So it might make more sense for you to be on this side so they can't walk in. They, they walk right into the back of you, and that keeps them from knocking it over. So like you would be standing about to orient you, you'd be standing a little more to your right. That's it. Okay. And you, then you would come up if you need to. So I'm going to turn it now so it's like a landscape. Jan, you're walking right in front of the camera. Where are you going? Nowhere. I wanted to do what about this. I don't know where you're keeping it. All right. I'm turning the mic. I'm putting the mic on the table. Okay. So you need to give that to a runner. So who's who's the runner that's going to handle this? So Dave Green is right behind you. Okay. So the mic. So David Green has one mic.
And then if I if I need you to, to come stand here, I'll just raise my hand like I did last time. Okay, that's good. That's cool, the way you got to stand up. Just yeah. You have to hold it. Oh, it's so much better. Yeah, it's and, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're able to do it long ways, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. 
Okay, everybody. Everybody's pretty much here except for a couple of people. So I'm thinking we can go ahead and start a little bit early. Yeah. And um, so I'm Jan Santos, and I'm the general manager, and I want to welcome everybody here. Some people, I'm, I'm happy that all the people that regularly come are here, and all you new people. And I'd really like to encourage you to talk with each other, and you people that are new, be sure to ask us any questions that you have about the center, and, um, and I hope you'll come back. And um, I'll just tell you briefly that we have at the center, we have social activities, we have classes, um, we, um, we have a good time. And um, it's, it's a really important place to, for people to get support and to get information back and forth. So that's kind of what I would like to convey about our center in a, in a really brief, brief, brief way. And then I just wanted to say that this, this workshop is, is the second in our series on advocacy. And this is on transportation and mobility. And I want to just kind of, you know, the, the idea of all these workshops is to give people tools so they can stand up for their rights and do what they need to to get their needs, needs met. And in this particular case today, um, at the end we're going to be having a brainstorming session. So I'd like for all of you to keep in mind the things that are important to you and the, some of the solutions that are going to be proposed today and that the center can be a place for people to organize to, together and give each other support down the road. We can have, people can have meetings here if they want to, to make plans for how to um, advocate for yourselves. And so the other thing I wanted to just say briefly, if I can do it, I wanted to give you a little bit of orientation to the room. So I am now at the side of the room where the kitchen is, and the, I'm facing the street, which is on the, the far side of the room. So I just want to say the bathrooms are behind me, um, and there are people here who will help you if you need any assistance. Raise your hand. And while I'm on raising hands, when we have question times, if you just speak and raise your hand so people uh, are aware that you want to speak, we have mic runners who will bring the mic around so you can be heard by everybody. And then let me see, there's one more thing. Oh, just a little comment about fire safety. In case there was a fire, we would ask everybody to exit to your right to the end of the table, and then people will direct you how to get to the, the double doors, which is the main way to get out of here, is on the street side, so it's in front of me across the room, and uh, in front of me across the room. Two by two. Uh -huh. Two by two. Two by two. Oh, I was going to just say, yeah, connect up with the people on either side of you, right, Patty? I mean, I don't know how it's just simple. So just try to connect to the people that are next to you so that everybody has a way to get out and, and just to try to make it a little easier. But we're not going to have to deal with that, but I, I wanted to say it just in case. So let me see. Is there anything else I forgot? Anybody? Cell, cell phones, Jan. Oh, thank you. Yeah, could everybody turn off your devices because we're, we're, um, we're um, live streaming it on Facebook. And uh, so that interferes with the connection. And is there anything else? I think that's it. I hope. So, Leah, I'm going to turn it over to you now, and um, are you going to do it from back there? Where are you? No, I'm here. Oh, where are you? Where are you? I'm right here. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's helpful. Point a little louder. <laughs> where are you? Here you go. Point a little bit louder, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jan, for that uh, great introduction to this morning's um, workshop. 
Um, so I'm, I'm Leah Gardner, and I am Vice President of the Board of Directors here. I just wanted to, before we get started, I wanted to thank our volunteers who've been helping this morning. Mark Greeley at the door, and Sadie Hundensky, who uh, very, very generously offered to go pick up donuts at uh, Dream Pop yeah. Bakery at 7.30 this morning yeah. on Saturday. That's, that's dedication. We really appreciate that. Um, and Jack, if you stay. Excuse me, I need Sadie when you have time. I'm here. Sorry, logistics for a second. Okay. Um, so if you have not had uh, anything this morning, we do have donuts and we have um, soft-boiled eggs. So if you need anything, raise your hand. We have a couple volunteers that can help. And also, thank you to uh, Patty Nash, who has been sitting at the registration table. Thanks so much, Patty, for, for stepping up and giving us a hand today. And all of you have collected your uh, transportation money that asked for it and uh, packets from Jan and Dorothy. So thank you both for, for sitting at the table and helping distribute that. So we have, for our first presentation this morning, we have Daniel Klein here. I know a few of you at the center have actually um, worked with Daniel. <laughs> Daniel has been a licensed orientation and mobility instructor since 2007. And he most recently worked for the Lions Center for the Blind before they closed last August. Um, at this point, he is kind of juggling his time between San Diego. He just had a new grandchild. Yay. And um, I asked him this morning, he is uh, available if anybody after our program today would like to speak with him about individual training. He does not work for an agency at this point, but he does do um, individual private pay training. So please talk with him if you need assistance. <laughs> so I want to, uh, and thanks everybody for for coming out on this really dreary day. Uh, I talked with Dan, and I don't know if all of you realize this, but we're all going to go outside, and you're going to practice cane That's technique right. this morning. That's it. That's it. Uh, <laughs> especially when it's sensible. Just joking. Just joking. <laughs> Dan probably has a look of horror on his face. <laughs> right. So, without further uh, rant, uh, you know, without further talk from me, let's get started. Welcome to the East Bay Center, Daniel Klein. Yay. Good morning. I, I have to say I am so happy to be here and see some of my uh, friends again. And, and I uh, am unused to the uh, high tech going on here. I, I uh, kind of like to walk around and pace a little bit while I talk. But, um, I was uh, going to try to stand pretty close in one place here so I can kind of fit in with, with the program. Uh, and I was really happy this morning when I got up and saw the rain because the freshness of rain on the ground and the smells, and it makes me feel like the earth is brand new again. And uh, that always makes me feel good. Anyway, I'm glad to be here with you, and I want to uh, launch right into this. And uh, perhaps uh, when we get to the end, if you have any questions, we can focus on that. I've uh, written down some remarks uh, that I've worked on this week. And I just wanted to start uh, by describing myself for you, my non-visual friends. Uh, I'm not 20 years old, and I can't party all night and get to work the next day. Uh, these aren't uh, impairments or disabilities. So a 20-year-old might say that I am lacking something. Uh, I am an older adult with short hair, mostly brown in color, which tends to be a little messy on the top with some gray at my temples. 
I'm neither fat nor skinny, except in my middle, which sticks out a little bit. Uh, therefore, my belt is fitted in the last notch at That's the it. end to keep my black pants from falling down around my knees, which a 20-year-old in the hood might also think of as a fashion impairment. I do not. Who I am and how I look changes from time to time. No one stays the same forever. Our friends, our neighbors, everyone else will change over time, especially babies and small children who can do absolutely nothing for themselves. They will change also, gaining abilities they do not yet have. Whenever I go somewhere important, I shower first, I comb my hair, I put on my best sports jacket and black leather shoes, as I have done for you here today. Um, my abilities include um, a graduate level degree in special education at San Francisco State University. And these credentials I acquired after the age of 50. And they were necessary in order that I become a certified orientation mobility specialist, a teacher of blind and low vision children and adults. Uh, today I want to talk to you about three areas of development for safe and graceful mobility during our travels using fixed routes, crossing streets, and when we travel on paratransit or public transportation. Uh, so we're going to discuss self-development, insight and planning, and community engagement uh, in the context of mobility in the 21st century. So I wanted to begin this morning with really some important concepts of self-development. And I'm going to, I don't know if any of you, uh, I'm the son of a preacher, so uh, I am used to those meetings where you have call and response. I don't know if any of you have uh, ever been to an old-time revival meeting where they had call and response, but uh, today I want to, to engage you a little bit, and I'd like you to repeat after I have said, I have abilities, I am not disabilities. So if you will, I'm going to call out, and let me have you respond. I have abilities, I am not disabilities. I have abilities. Thank you, one more time. I have abilities, I am not disabilities. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't hear that. What was the second half? I am not disabilities. Yeah. You know, I'm going to turn that hearing aid up. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I want to think about this for a moment with you all, because normally people define each other as we do ourselves by what we do and who we are. We do not define people by what they don't do and who they are not. For our example, our good friend Connie, she's not a coal miner, she's not a long distance runner. <laughs> Therefore, we don't call her Connie, the person who doesn't run disabled and who doesn't mind disabled coal. We do call her Connie, our friend who uses a mobility cane for travel. She may not see a book in a dark room at midnight, and yet, if she wanted to, she could read a book at any time using Braille or computer technology. So then, that is one of Connie's abilities. It would be ridiculous and wrong to call her a disabled reader. She has the ability to read a book at midnight with the lights turned off. She can also cross the street using a mobility cane. And perhaps she can also ride a bus where she wants to go without needing visual impressions of the driver or the bus or even the street signs along her travel route. She can do these things because she has worked at self-development. Our abilities, our age, and even our clothes are a part of here, who we are here today. And tomorrow may be different. We may have different abilities. Things change. People change. For this reason, when we shout the word disability, and even our disability during our experiences here at the East Bay Blind Center. For travel today, tomorrow, or any time in the future, we must also develop and use our abilities for efficiency and safety. As is the case for all citizens, we would like to be seen as graceful and confident in our movements. When necessary, we pretty much got to demand and require 
recognition of our abilities and plan to use our skills success, uh, uh, successfully. When sighted people who use vision for travel view a blind travel independently, they frequently express amazement. I've seen this. Often, they have no idea of the work and self-development required for our non-visual travel. They haven't a clue. In fact, many are frightened because they haven't a clue. After years of personal conversations with my sighted peers and blind friends, I have learned that the fear of disability is often the first thought people have when they think of blindness. However, shortly following the first thought, a second impression arises that's generally positive in the sense that uh, of projecting oneself into what is imagined as what they imagine as the blind experience when we see blind people move about independently. In other words, people deal with their own fears by imagining what they themselves might do in a similar situation. I really feel that one of the most important things we can do as low vision or non vision travelers is to be in the community and to be seen. Uh, it really changes the whole paradigm of how people interact. For those who stop to consider blindness at all, viewing blind travelers using a mobility cane really can change their uh, attitude in a positive direction. Because avoiding fear is a natural human response, something to run away from. This is why sympathy is so toxic it is based on fear of loss. Sympathy is the coin we put in a beggar's cup. Exchanging the coin of sympathy for empathy will bring us a step closer to experiencing a greater equality of friendship, of citizenship, and friendship for the blind. Empathy is an important word which describes basically the daily experience of blind travelers. So let me define that for you from the dictionary. Empathy, from the Greek word pathos, or feeling, meaning the power of mentally identifying oneself and so comprehending a person or object of contemplation. Think about that. Isn't that what blind travelers do all the time, every day? Uh, this is one ability that blind and low vision citizens use every day. The blind must mentally identify themselves with other persons and objects just to move around the room. They have to mentally formulate, where is the table? Where is the chair? Where is my friend? Where do I want to sit? And we do it mentally within our own frame of reference. A major requirement of low vision and no vision is to learn and use the ability to sense the immediate environment. I would suggest to you that the experience of blindness and low vision requires us to develop empathy as a primary ability in our personal development. Self-development and mobility requires that we sense and feel our, our environment. I believe it's that, that, I believe that certainly would be too much of a complex assignment for somebody who was disabled and had no abilities. What a non-visual person does every day requires a stage of steps and progress that sighted people cannot even approach without maybe wearing a blindfold for a year. Uh, I have tried moving around for an entire week under blindfold and that experience for me was a real eye-opener, as they say. Um, some sighted people insist that blind or disabled and need sympathy, which is defined as feelings of pity and sorrow for the suffering or grief from another. But blind citizens focused on using their abilities don't profit from sympathy. Blind people of ability only want to have an opportunity to use their abilities, as is the right of all citizens. The pursuit of happiness is guaranteed in the Constitution. Pity, sympathy, and sorrow aren't guaranteed. 
And as we all experience with the Department of Rehab and other agencies assigned to dish out sympathy, it's withdrawn at any moment if they feel like it. Um, so when we discard the term disability from our thinking, we change the context of our personal development onto the firm ground of citizens' rights, not pity, not handouts, not gimmies, not sympathetic pennies tossed into our cup. Leaving behind the outdated concepts associated with the word disability, we should gain power to demand that sighted people also develop the empathy and connection with the needs of non-visual travelers. Our travel journeys begin with our recognition of who we are, what we want to do, and the abilities that we intend to apply for accomplishing our goals. This, I believe, is the significant change from the past, and the message that I have abilities, I'm not defined by disabilities, is the key to opening that door. Do I hear any amen? amen. amen. Uh, insight and planning for travel is a vital consideration for non-visual mobility. And I want to turn our attention a little bit to recent developments in street planning and construction that really should concern us. And once again, these constructions have been developed to improve the experience of sighted citizens and drivers without regard or sympathy for non-visual travelers. So these developments uh, really are designed for people who have eyeballs and travel around visually and don't give a second thought to where they are, who's around them, and what other people require for use of their abilities. Uh, these two intersection types I wanted to discuss a little bit with you today are uh, called scatter boxes and roundabouts. Have any of you encountered these? Yep. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, scatter box is kind of a, a, a term that is applied uh, to some intersections in downtown Oakland. Uh, there are two on Franklin Street crossing 8th and 9th Streets and two on Webster Street crossing 8th and 9th Streets. Uh, so this represents four different intersections in a busy commercial setting. So picture, if you will, if you haven't seen the scatter box or you're not sure what I'm saying, when I, what I mean when I say scatter box, um, it's a regular intersection at which two streets come together at a perpendicular angle, crossing one another uh, in a plus shape with routine crosswalks at the four corner positions. The difference at a scatter box crossing is that in addition to the painted crosswalks from one side of the street to another, there's also an X-shaped crosswalk painted in the middle of the intersection. This X crosswalk allows pedestrians to cross the street in all directions at the same time. Have you ever experienced that? No. Yeah. Uh, at a regular traffic signal controlled intersection, the light changes to a red ball on one street and the other street gets a green ball and drivers accelerate on the street with the red signal. Cars and drivers are stopped so that sighted and non-sighted pedestrians can cross the street. At a scatterbox intersection, all streets get a red traffic signal at the same time, and all cars and drivers must stop, and no right turns on red. All pedestrians cross the perpendicular streets at all four corners at the same time. That sounds safe, right? All cars are stopped. What's the problem with that? Yeah, the problem is it's a good car, a good idea for cars to stop in all directions, but the loss of sound cues from moving vehicles really makes it difficult for a non-visual traveler, if not impossible. Uh, furthermore, the other pedestrians crossing around us may be going in any direction, and the sounds of their movements don't really help. Uh, so the best feature of the scatter box is that all cars are stopped at the change of the signal and all cars go with the green lighted signal while we wait at the corner. Also, these types of intersections are typically found in busy downtown commercial areas, so generally there's a lot of people around um, and that can be helpful as you know. 
Uh, before we discuss the safety requirements of crossing this intersection, I want to talk about what I think is really a more difficult problem, the roundabouts. Uh, has anybody seen roundabouts? Yep. Close by, do you remember where it was at? Is that the islands? No. Yeah, I'll, I'll describe it. It's a big circle. Um, uh, there's a big one in Albany where six streets and feed into a big circle. In fact, the intersection is called the circle. Uh, the feeder streets are Arlington Avenue, Marin Avenue, Los Angeles Avenue, Mendocino Avenue, Indian Rock Avenue, and Del Norte Street. Wow. Six streets bring cars into a large circle-shaped paved area in which there is a huge water fountain in the center. Drivers are supposed to slow down, though many do not, and then they join into the circle with the cars going around and around until they approach the street they want to be on, and then they exit the circle, continuing on their way home or to work or wherever. Uh, travelers on foot walk around the circle, crossing each incoming street as they come to the curb or pedestrian warning strip, if there's even one present. We all know what, uh, what the bumps are, right? Pedestrian warning strip? I hope. Uh, although there's not enough of them out there, and they really like the way that cities try to save money so instead of you get to the corner and you're looking for that bumpy strip, especially searching for it with your cane, and instead of putting two strips down, one facing one street and the other facing the other street, they just skip, scoop yeah. out the end of the curve and they yeah. put one strip. Oh, yeah. And if you step off from that strip, guess what happens? You're in the middle. Oh, yeah, you're, you're totally you don't have a right angle. Incredible. I can't believe it. So it's another, it's another way cities toss pennies into the cup. It's like, oh, you're a blind traveler, you need a pedestrian warning strip. Fine, we know there should be two, but we're going to save a little money and put down one. You figure it out. Um, vehicles approaching and those already in the circle are difficult to track by hearing on approach at the circle. Uh, and determining their directionality of ultimate movement, forget about it, because they're all going around the circle. Yep. It's especially true in Albany because the approaching streets are not equally level for a distance prior to a ra arrival at the circle. So you may, may hear cars approaching from one street and completely miss out on cars approaching from another street because it's either lower or higher. There are no perpendicular streets entering and leaving the circle, which makes veering during our crossing really dangerous. Though there are other problems as well, it doesn't mean that you can't cross a roundabout. Um, depending upon the circumstance, time of day, and the actual intersection itself. Uh, we all know from our mobility cane training that public assistance or changing our route of travel could be an immediate solution to these crossings. So too, we understand that soliciting public assistance is one of our abilities. It's not a disability. That's why it should be practice. Excuse me, pardon me, is there anyone around? Could you give me a hand across? That's an ability. That's almost like a performance art because you are soliciting interaction with those around you. Uh, I, I don't know that theater or any other, any other uh, entertainment uh, requires more high wire leaping into the unknown than standing on a corner and asking for a person you don't know yet to become a temporary friend. Um, but because we have the ability of our insight, I love that word insight, because that's another ability that non-visual traveling requires. We are looking within ourselves with a vision of using our abilities, and it requires an insight that those people that use eye candy to get around don't really develop, because they're just used to looking at the pretty patterns and colors. Um, so, you know, if you have had that experience of soliciting public experience, you probably also have had the experience of some people saying not a word. One of my very first experiences in uh, traveling blindfolded 
was to go into a store and order something mm -hmm. with my mobility cane. Don't you love it when you come into a crowded area and everybody's yakking and you can kind of tell where things are at and they see you and suddenly the whole place goes quiet? Oh my God. Even the cashier shuts up and stops taking the money. How do I find who to pay? You know, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a troublemaker, so I like to just stand there and wag back and forth and move my head around and go, Hello! <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I know you've experienced it. It just made me. But it's another example. It's another example. Sighted people aren't used to seeing non-sighted people out and about, and they don't know what to do. And you know what? If that instant that, you know, when your heart jumps into your throat going, well, you know, what's going to happen now? Every one of them is more fearful than you are. They're afraid of being seen to make a mistake. So you can really take the pressure off of them. Um, Self-development and community <coughs> engagement leads us to the understanding that we must engage at planning stages for travel to stay current in an ever-changing environment. Not only in planning our individual journeys, but also participation in political discussions and decision-making affecting us where we live. If a roundabout intersection is built in our community, we need to be involved early in the design progress, uh, process for safe crossing spaces. We must remain focused on challenges of demonstrating to other community members, especially those who are cited, that our different abilities do not make us disabled. People with abilities do things and have accomplishments. Disabled people have things done to them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that leads me to the second uh, area I wanted uh, to talk about. Uh, community engagement, or actually the, uh, one of the most important uh, areas I want to talk about, community engagement, which means we've got to engage at the planning stages for daily living and travel, uh, again, by making ourselves visible. Not only when we're planning our individual journeys, also, but also participating in political decision making that has a direct effect upon where we live. If a roundabout intersection is to be built in our community, we've got to remain focused on the challenges of showing other community members, especially those that are cited, that our different abilities do not mean we can't or don't want to cross the street. If we don't want to cross today, tomorrow may be different. Take a deep breath. <laughs> I, I have so many things I would like to say uh, about the political environment at the moment, uh, and I'm afraid it would burn some ears and cause steam to come out of my mouth, so I'm going to kind of uh, hold back on that and just try to stay focused on what we need to do. Uh, but I have to mention uh, uh, a gentleman called Frederick Douglas. I'm a, a student of history. I love history. Yeah. Frederick Douglass was a gentleman during the Civil War era who was fighting against uh, the politics of his place and time. Uh, and he said, a power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and never will. Recently, we've all had experience on State Department of Rehab cuts and funding for blind travelers. Decisions such as these are generally within the power structures controlled by politicians who are male, sided, and relatively wealthy when compared to average citizens. But despite their wealth and privilege, politicians are not often observed to even possess the ability to express empathy for non-visual travelers. They're not bad people because of this inability to express empathy. But does this represent a disability on their part? No, not by our definition. The word disability does not define them or us, but they are willful in their disregard for the requirements of non-visual travelers. They really are. Again, like those warning strips. They, 
you know, they know or they should know, you don't put down one that points a traveler out to the middle of the intersection. It's just not a good idea. So can we expect them to surrender their power because of their empathy and power impairment? No, probably not without our demand that they and those around them develop and practice the ability to use empathy in their decisions to support transportation safety for all citizens, all citizens, including non-visual travelers. The East Bay Blind Center is an excellent location to achieve organization to facilitate political goals. As a representative form of government, as is our democracy, uh, our representatives can really only take action when they hear from us. And no matter what our abilities are, we can contact them. And if we contact them as a group, even a, a, a phone call uh, once a week or once a month or with some regularity, uh, it does get people's attention. I, I had the experience not long ago of working with uh, other groups of individuals who were uh, facing funding cutbacks in the 80s, 1980s. And I thought, you know, government, they don't listen. They can't hear me. But uh, because I was in danger of losing all the little income that I had, and several of my friends and people that I was working with were as well, I decided I'd go to Sacramento. I was amazed to find out that I could actually walk in to a representative's office, and I could actually talk to the representative, and I was amazed to find that it did have some small effect. Uh, wealthy people, those people that feel they're entitled to have it all, they hire people to camp out next door every day. So it does us no good to sit here in uh, our homes and not make contact with our political representatives. Uh, I also wanted to say that it's perhaps the best time in history to be a blind traveler, when you think about it, it really is. Uh, the technological advances I've seen just since I got my orientation mobility degree are fairly amazing. Um, today I have, as you may have also, a small computer in my pocket, sometimes called a smartphone. I don't know that you know it yet, but there are applications in these devices that will confirm time and space and your location, wherever you are in the world, which is great. Makes it kind of hard to get lost, which actually I enjoy doing from time to time. Uh, we can tell these devices where we want to go, and they'll provide instructions describing the time and distance of our proposed travel to our destination. Uh, we can know the streets we're traveling on, the shops around us, uh, we can know the next corner we're approaching and where we want to cross. The phone can photograph a street sign, uh, a menu, even a contract, and read it back to you on the spot. Wow, wow that's kind of great. Um, I, I was working with a young man. Of course, all young people have a lot better grasp on technology than I do. But I was working at a young man who was preparing to go to college up in... Uh, Vallejo, and uh, he was using his Google Maps. We were on a mobility lesson. We were going through a neighborhood that I had no idea where we were. I'd never been there before. <coughs> Excuse me. And I was slightly turned around. Uh, but I was using my mobility skills. You know, I had the, I, I noticed when we started off, the sunshine was in my face. Uh, I knew that that meant it was a certain time in the morning and we were headed east. Uh, I kind of remembered we had turned left and then we turned right. We'd gone a certain distance and whatnot. Well, the neighborhood we were going through and he was leading me, me actually, I was the teacher, but of course he was leading. And uh, he had never been there before either. Uh, unfortunately, what Google Maps didn't tell him was that it's a neighborhood of cul-de-sacs. <laughs> so we were like, 
in a corn maze. You know, like, oh, where are we now? Well, for about a minute, my face turned beet red, and I started thinking, my insight started saying, well, Daniel, very good. You are a new orientation mobility instructor who is lost <laughs> with a client on a lesson. Uh, and then I realized, my next thought, because I have the ability of insight, my next thought was, you know what, I actually have been trained to deal with getting around without this computer or Google Maps. And I thought, well, wait a minute. And I told, the, I told the young man, I said, you know what, you need to learn basic mobility skills before you rely on this device. Your battery, battery may run out and, and uh, it may have wrong information just as we have today. I said, I remember when we walked in here, the sunshine was on our face, right? He goes, right. I said, well, if we want to get out of here, where is the sunshine better be? At our back, of course. So anyway, long story short, we used some old school skills. Uh, I don't want to say that's better than having technology. I just want to say that go ahead and learn the technology. It's important, and it's going to take a lot of uh, fearful situations away from us, especially when you can call an Uber or a Lyft car in an instant to come pick you up take you home. Uh, when you get lost, but in the end, you definitely need basic mobility skills for uh, safe uh, getting around. Um, but to get back to that final thought, we really have to increase our political organization and our visibility in the communities where we live. Our fellow citizens, they need training in what to do with us and how to deal with us. And they need to see and hear our demands. Though we can't know who will see us when we walk on the sidewalks outside, we do understand that we can't be seen at all sitting at home. If we have a telephone or a commuter or a computer, we can communicate with our community and state representatives. We can network with others who share our concerns at the blind center, churches, other locations, and including on the internet. Uh, all things change and uh, so we do also with the knowledge that we're defined by the abilities we have and how we use them. Wow, what a great time to be alive. Thank you. Especially about scatter boxes or roundabouts. Uh, the one thing that I skipped over, you know, I'm, I'm kind of reminding myself uh, of what I wanted to say, so I wrote everything down. Of course, I skipped over a big part. But uh, the part I wanted to uh, not skip over about roundabouts is um, traffic engineers say that roundabouts are really much safer because cars need to slow down on approach and you only have to cross one street at a time without a cross street in your way, and so it's safer. Well, they're talking about sighted people. They're talking about sighted people. Uh, and even worse than that, there was a transportation study uh, done a couple of years back where they looked at a new roundabout that was put in in Nashville, Tennessee. And what they found during the study was that if you cross this roundabout uh, one time a day, every day for three months, there is a 99% chance you're going to get hit. Well, what if you're going to church or the grocery store and you cross it going there and you cross it getting back? That means in a month and a half, every month and a half, there's a 99% chance of getting hit. That's not acceptable. That really is not acceptable. And I believe there are a lot of, I, I've traveled a good deal overseas, and I've, there have been roundabouts there a good long while. And there are different ways of handling roundabout crossings that can be made safer. But unless we're engaging in this conversation, they're going to make roundabouts so that drivers don't have to slow down or even stop, and they're going to put them as many places as they can that's, that's not what 
we want to see. So uh, political engagement is, is so important. We could, for example, when meetings are held here, uh, get on the phone bank and call the local representative up in Sacramento and make a call to the uh, representative in Washington and say, hey, you know, there are benefit cuts and we need it to go the other direction. Anyway, uh, any questions about, yeah, in the back? <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Basically, uh, I, uh, I have a different kind of intersectional challenge. Oh, okay. My name is Earl. Uh, I have another intersectional challenge. Uh, the neighborhood I live in was built in the 60s, and they thought it would be really clever instead of having corners to just sweep around at like a 30 foot radius. And sometimes I follow that around as if, as if there's no point in there. Right, right. And, and that, that's another issue. I'm never sure what to do with that either. So uh, I since the streets aren't straight, so I'm used to following that. Uh, you know, one suggestion I have, and I experienced this, there's a lady here I worked with in Alameda, Susie. And... Uh, uh, when she would come to the corner, uh, the sidewalk was perfectly flat and level with the street and no warning strips. Okay? Impossible. Impossible. So I thought, okay, I'm, I'm you know, kind of, I know I got too much to do and too many things and, and gee, I'm running around like crazy, but I'm going to take a chance and call uh, the city. And so I got on the phone and I asked around and said, who's in charge of, you know, the street improvements and whatnot? To my amazement, I got a lady on the line who said, oh, yeah, okay, I, I'm, you know, I, I know the department responsible for that street. And I said, you know, we have to have a learning strip. I was even more amazed with what was in about, what was it, Susie, a couple of weeks? They actually came and put one down. That's unusual. Generally, we have to be a lot more patient. I would suggest in your neighborhood, call the local city administration. Try to determine who's responsible for, you know, not getting sued when the pavement's broken and somebody falls down on it. And uh, talk to that person. I don't like to use the word disability at all. However, when we're talking with people who are uneducated, especially politicians, we occasionally have to use the disability lever and remind them that there are uh, laws on the books. And you might suggest to them in your neighborhood or start a conversation at least, is there some kind of detectable surface? or a strip or something that could be placed uh, around your near your intersections that would give you a to that. If they can't do it and there's, uh, for example, a homeowner uh, that owns the piece of lawn next to the inside lip of the sidewalk, maybe that person could be convinced to put a decorative accessory on their lawn that might be a, uh, a landmark. Right. So those are just a couple ideas that jumped to my mind. Definitely, even if nothing gets done and you just make the contact, you have done us all a service because you're starting to educate people that we're here, we're not going away, and we need these things that have our rights observed as Everybody else has their rights. Uh, other questions? I have a question for them. I think they're, they're passing a microphone around, so they'll uh, bring the microphone to. Well, I'll get you next. So go ahead. Over yes, to the I left. want to know who do. Uh, I have someone in the nursing home. Okay. He's totally blind. There's two people there. Yes, ma'am. And I want to know. Is it anyone that can go out to try to get 
try to train them how to walk and go different places. And they don't know anything about Braille. Their families don't know anything. Yeah. They yeah. just dropped them off at the nursing home yeah. and left. So I wanted to know if it's someone in Oakland that can help them to become independent. Okay. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I have uh, provided Jan with a resource list that's been railed, I understand, and I think probably I can make it available online also if need be. And did you have maybe an answer to this question? I see you in the middle raising your hand. Yeah. Do you have a suggestion? For I, I might have something to so, but anyway, uh, a resource list. It's not a happy story because, uh, again, they don't want to toss the pennies in our cup. So resources actually are kind of drying up, but there are still some. Yes. Um, here's the situation. Um, my name is Maureen, and I, I happen to work in the field of aging for the local uh, area agency on aging. The, the problem that we're having, especially in skilled nursing facilities, is that um, due to their insurance coverage, they feel that if a, a young <coughs> person even moves or is allowed to move or something happened to them that it violates their, uh, their policy you know, with their insurance. Um, there is, however, um, the Ombudsman Office, uh, every county has one, and they have volunteers that can come out and help advocate with the facility staff. Now that still kind of leaves the uh, situation of finding an instructor or someone, um, which, which is a different, different question, but um, I think that the Ombudsman where, where the facility staff would be, um, they, they often are the ones that really need the education so that something can, can happen. So the Ombudsman office, um, with their volunteers, might be a good resource. Thank you. And this young lady over here in the middle of the question. Okay. Um, and is this mic working? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you get to an intersection and push the button, you know, to right. um, know where it's safe to go or not, how many seconds are allotted, you know, theoretically you can get from one side of the street to the other, uh, or is it, does it vary depending on what street you're at when it has a signal? That's my question. That's a great question, so it's uh, why I will always have a job. Uh, there is no, there is no standard answer. Uh, so, and whenever I'm training uh, with people for mo mobility, the thing that I always recommend is stand at that intersection, even if you've crossed the intersection before, and do an intersection analysis. And what I mean by that is. Listen for the cars starting and stopping on the perpendicular streets. The, the street you want to cross is the perpendicular street. The street that is to your left or to your right uh, is the street that when the cars are going, they're blocking the street you want to cross. So when you're doing your analysis, you're counting in your insight, using your insight in your mind, you're counting how long those cars that are going on the street you don't want to cross are still moving. Once they stop moving, that means the street you want to cross is probably going to get a green light and you don't want to be out in the middle. So in our street crossing analysis, what we typically do, even if we've crossed the street before and we know, oh, this is a short one or it's a long one, generally you want to spend a, uh, two or three signal changes just counting again to make sure how many seconds you have. Now what they don't tell you is that once that countdown starts with a pedestrian signal, um, often the traffic engineers will leave a couple of extra seconds after it hits the zero mark where the uh, uh, street that's uh, starting to move has not yet got the green light. So they allow a little extra time. 
But uh, the answer to your question is, there's no fixed answer. You have to analyze the crossing to make sure uh, when the cars stop and when they start. I hope that's helpful. Oh, yeah, many. Uh, also, uh, Microphone. 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 Microphone.
They won't be drunk. They will obey the traffic laws. They will stop at stop signs and traffic signals. They won't cut people off. They won't weave in and out of traffic. Basically, what you have to worry about is those terrible vehicles that are being piloted by humans. Those are the ones we have to worry about. While self-driving cars won't be perfect, they'll, be, they'll have sensors. They will see us as we cross the street, and they'll stop, because they won't be speeding. They won't be texting. And, and, and so basically, I'm looking forward to the safety of self-driving cars. I, I think I would agree with that, and that's why I say it's, it's a wonderful uh, uh, time. Uh, it's a wonderful time. How about this? How about now? Now, maybe? Okay. Anyway, it's a great, you know, because of technology, there are new things happening that are going to work in our favor. So I agree with you. Uh, however, it will be much improved if we have input, if we let the designers and developers know what our uh, non-visual needs are. Uh, I was, uh, Mr. Nick Blackshear over here was a person I have worked with in the past. And he taught me an awful lot about mobility technology. And I would uh, just uh, let you all know, if you haven't met Nick before, he is uh, kind of a whiz at uh, using devices for non-visual travelers. And he really helped me learn how to use a trekker. Anybody else? Yeah. Daniel, I have a microphone, but I didn't know if anyone else had a question for me. I have a question. Uh, so, uh, I was just listening to you talk about self-driving cars, and, uh, you know, a couple of things popped out of me. One is that, uh, that it's various businesses that are doing it, and some of them have an interest in getting their self-driving cars out on the roads as quickly as possible. So, and I'm talking about Uber. So, anyway, uh, Uber is famous for cutting corners in terms of, you know, how things work. And what I think is a really good value for the uh, center is... Uh, and I, I, this is a question pointing it at you, uh, Daniel, uh, that the center could contribute by, you know, making this a, a place where the car companies can come to and, uh, you know, work with the blind community about how to make it work best. And so that's, do you think that's a good idea? I think it's yes. a wonderful idea. Again, I mentioned Nick again. I was talking to him the other day about some technology. The microphone isn't working, sir. Talking to Nick about some technology well, hold, hold, hold that on, he's they working with. Yeah, I don't know. I'll be there in a minute. Okay. okay. Let's hang on to that mic. Yeah. Let me come over in the meantime and grab your mic. <laughs> so uh, this is a uh, this is a problem with batteries. Yeah. And okay. you know, technology is always uh, yeah. promises you a million so, things. That's why I say. And then something goes wrong. So. That's why I say uh, uh, you get your old school skills first, just in case the power goes out. But uh, uh, in in technology, uh, it's all about testing and getting it out there. And often, uh, and I mentioned Nick, we were talking last week about uh, a piece of technology he's working on. And the suggestion I had was, why not make direct contact with the company? You know, yeah. call, call Google and say, this is East Blade Blind Center. Uh, you're the uh, community liaison person. How about uh, if we become involved with your company for what they like to call beta? testing, which is testing a product before it's in general release. Often when they get a new uh, phone application or a new program uh, in development, they'll call that the beta stage, meaning that it's not quite right, and so they're going to be fiddling around with it for a while. And so sometimes you can get some uh, economic uh, benefits and inputs from being on that end of things with them that ordinarily you just wouldn't have the access. So I say, again, call and make contact. Become visible, not invisible. 
Dan, I actually had a question because this has not been touched on, and I kind of think it's a it's a critical topic. Okay. I think there's a lot of people know in this room at the end of June of this year, the Department of Rehabilitation ended what used to be called the Homemaker Plan. Yep. And one thing that I'm seeing is a lot of people are either not seeking employment or they're retired, are having a lot of problems at this point getting some of the crucial trainings they need, especially folks that lose vision um, later in life. Um, and I'm wondering if there's any kind of resource list out there in terms of mobility instructors who are available and not affiliated with an organization whose primary payer is the Department of Rehabilitation that can come out and work with people on an individual basis for maybe one or two hours just to help with them um, walking around the neighborhood, going to a local store. Because I'm really seeing this become a, um, a major problem right now. Yeah, before I came today, I did spend a week talking with some of my O&M friends at Lighthouse and, and other organizations. And there's really, you know, I can't find a list of freelancers or people that aren't uh, doing it with an organization like Lighthouse. Uh, Kat Jones, uh, working at Lighthouse, who used to work with me and mobility at Line Center, assured me and I put it on our resource page that their Ed Roberts Center can be open uh, by appointment. And oh yes, you can uh, you know go jump on the bar there at Ashby and come on over to San Francisco. But she says that uh, they are having two mobility instructors, the Lighthouse is, uh, trying to keep up with East Bay here. But uh, again, when you're ever talking with a state agency or department of rehab, I found that you never approach them about getting services by saying, well, I, I want to do anything but get off your roles and go to work. Or, you know, it, again, it's the small change that, that they want to give to people who aren't uh, so-called mainstream. Or, and it is called the Department of Rehabilitation, mm -hmm. which means you had a job they want in the shortest time possible to put you back on that job. So they just cut everybody else. So again, this is one of the reasons that we no longer can remain invisible because mm -hmm. if we stay invisible, there will be more and more and more cuts, not improvements. And I know there are mobility instructors being graduated all the time from San Francisco State. So I have some ideas I want to talk over with the East Bay board members and suggestions and maybe get back to you on that, um, but there is a sheet, there is a sheet of resources that uh, Jan said that she had brailed. And, uh, it's so, in your packets. Yeah. 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 So I think, I think so, I'm uh, exceeding the, the time allotted here, so let me pass the microphone off. I have a quick question for you. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, one of the things that I've noticed here after traveling in Europe for a while is it's hard to find the center of Walk because you know you've got your lines for sighted folks, but you don't have them for us. And I'm wondering what your, if you have any thoughts on that. I really like the auditory pedestrian signals, uh, and traffic engineers have those available to them right now if they if they can find a way to purchase them. Uh, I, I like that the uh, street crossing buttons, the few of them that there are, make a little sound that I can kind of hone in on. I can kind of you know, guide myself to that button because uh, I can hear it. But are you walking in the center of the street? To cross uh, the you mean crossings at yes. this at the midpoint? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, if they do pedestrian okay. signals at those crossings that we could hear, that would make it accessible. Anyway, I hope that's a helpful yep. answer. Here's the mic. Uh, Dan, this is wonderful. This is David, by the way. Get on the mic. And, uh, Get on the mic. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Boy. Okay. 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 I want to thank Dan very much. This is really been wonderful. And I hope you will come back to us again. Yeah. And we look forward to your presentation to the board and we can have you come to
a business meeting, um, and I, I am really excited about it, talking about advocacy. I think this is great, and I'm glad you're all here. And as development coordinator, I'm especially glad you're here because we have a grant. We've got to spend the money. But seriously, uh, this is a great opportunity for the center to get on the map and to really get involved with advocacy. And although there are certain rules for nonprofits, to whether we can engage in direct advocacy or not, we can work with people. People can come here and use the center for meetings and, and that kind of thing. So now we're going to turn to fixed route. I have been instructed where to stand. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, I don't want to get in the way of the video here. And uh, I want to say that Kelly McCarthy is streaming our video today. Let's give her a big <laughs> So now we're going to talk about fixed route transportation, but I think that one of the themes for today is on-demand service. And it means that you can go when you want, where you want, and that you don't have to be encumbered by uh, a transit agencies telling you when they're going to pick you up or when they're not going to pick you up, and being early and late, and all the kind of things we've talked about before. And today we're looking at positive possibilities and improvements. Uh, for both fixed route and paratransit. And today, we're going to hear from a couple of people who are going to talk about transportation that they would like to see and that uh, projects that are happening right now uh, in various parts of the country as well. And I want to start by inviting Ray Marcus. Yeah, I'm here at the oh, table. okay. Is there a chair? Okay, would you, okay uh, I've been asked to ask people to turn your cell phones, please, because okay, some of you have not done so. Okay. Um, the other thing is that if you walk by the okay, if you walk by the table up here where I'm standing, uh, no, uh, that you need to walk behind this table and not in front of it because Kelly is video. You're doing the video here, and you might run into a stand tip it over and that would be a disaster. So if you come up, this, this table is right near to the right of the kitchen that I'm, I'm talking about. Okay, so if you just try to be careful and we'll monitor to make sure that, you know, you know there's no catastrophe here. Anyway, I, okay, Ray is going to talk about AC Transit Flex and it's a great idea. It's being tested in Newark and Castro Valley, it's a form of on-demand bus transportation, right? Yes. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Ray Marcus, and I'd like to welcome those that are here for the very first time. And like Jan Santos mentioned earlier about our programs and our services and our classes, please come back. There are a lot of people here that can really help you and just answer questions. If not, we can uh, have you get to the right person. But anyway, um, can you hold this way? Can you read my note? Thank you. There we go. Good job. Okay, and um, thank you. I got it. Okay. And I'd just like to say that I've been coming here. I'm a member for the last seven years, and I'm on four committees, and I'm also a director on the board. And um, could, you t uh, so could somebody give me like a time limit, like a halfway point, two minute warning, and one minute? Um, I will. Thank you. Okay, and um, my next question for everybody is that um, I'm on a short time here, and if you have questions and answers for me afterwards, I feel free to answer any questions after, during lunch, or if you have any questions, say something comes up after the workshop, I'm usually here on Fridays from 9 to 3, and anything regarding AC Transit, um, if I can help you with, you know, give me your name, or your number, and a question, I can get back to you as soon as possible. And um, let's see. And uh, when I was first approached to talk about AC Transit, I said yes immediately. I've lived in the East Bay all my whole life in three different towns. So I was trying to remember the first time I rode on AC Transit. And when I lived with my grandparents and my uncles and stuff, my grandmother never drove a car. One of my uncles never drove a car. So anyway, um, I've been thinking, how many years has it been? 
So I've been counting on my fingers and ran out of fingers, counting on my toes, <laughs> ran out of my toes, and I asked people, can I borrow your fingers and your toes because there's been so many years since I've been writing Nancy Transit. So arithmetic, this year, I've been writing AC transfer for 50 years. So, and we had a joke in our family. We didn't call it Alameda County Transit. We didn't call it AC Transit. AC Transit was so important in our family growing up, we called it Aunt Clara. <laughs> so, I also want to let everybody know that those of you that were here for the workshop on advocacy, I've been trying to get a contact person in charge of Flexbus, and I've been calling AC Transit and letting them know about feedback. And I'm actually going to hear me say feedback they think is negativity. And I, I'm giving them positive feedback. And I said, oh, is there a contact person, phone number? They said, well, we, we don't have that information. I'm thinking to myself, well, if you're taking down my information, who are you giving it to? So then I would ask flex drivers the same thing, and they really didn't even have a question for me. And I was asking passengers, and I couldn't get anywhere. So um, yesterday I was here at the center, and I was going back home on board, taking the flex bus. I just missed the flex bus by two minutes. So I waited another half hour for the next flex bus. But I think it was a blessing in disguise, because when the door opened, it was one of my favorite flex bus drivers. She knows everything and anything. And when I'm on her bus, she'll tell the passengers on the last day, I won't be here for two weeks. She trains new incoming drivers. So what I just told you earlier about not finding the right person, so I told her yesterday, I said, could you give me a contact person? She gave me, she gave me the, um, the person's name, the superintendent's name, their district, where they're operating from, their phone number. So as soon as I got home, I, that was the first thing I did. I figured Friday afternoon, I'm just going to get his message. He answered the phone. So when I told him what I've been telling all of you about just getting the run, run around, he says, you're Ray Marcus, aren't you? And I said, yes, because uh, I've been getting all your positive feedback. <laughs> and, and then I said, uh, and, then I, and then I told him, I said, um, well, I do have a couple negative uh, things, but most of it is positive. And this made me chuckle when I said, how can I advocate to keep this not as a pilot program, but as, you know, just a fixed route that we can make our reservations? And what made me chuckle is he says, well, we do have board meetings twice a month, and I'm thinking to myself, I've talked a lot about, I'm not, I've talked a lot to board directors before. Yeah. You know, I'm one. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he told me that on the second and the fourth Wednesday of each month on 16th in Franklin and Oakland, they have a, a board meeting, and that what I need to talk to keep this flex bus running is to let um, the board of directors know. So. I'm planning on coming, going to one of the, the, the meetings this month and just be such a pain in the butt to them that they know who I am when I first walk in because this really helps a lot of people. And that's why I want to take, talk about our service here. I asked the, the, um, the superintendent yesterday, why did they pick just Newark and Castro Valley? And they said, well, they, they really didn't have any ideas, but they figured they would just do, do these two cities. Well, when I was riding, riding the 275 bus, that got discontinued, and that was my main bus route five days a week. And that's what took the flex bus route. So how the flux, flex, bus work, flex bus works <laughs> is that when you first sign up, you either give them your email address or your phone number. And then every time you call, you can, if you, have a reser you want to make a reservation, you can call three weeks before or half hour before you pick up. So their services are from 6.10 in the morning, their bus routes are 6.10 in the morning and 6.40 in the evening. So tell them what bus stop you'll be at and it's a shuttle bus, which is nice and they're really good at making new turns and you know they're very flexible and you know it depends on what side of the street you're on because my main street that I catch the bus is Haley at Cedar and they never know what um, side of the street I'm gonna be on but when they see me just standing there, they know it's me. So, um, and the other, the only other thing is that uh, when you make a time, like for example, say if I wanted to be uh, at my bus stop at 8.30 in the morning, they'll give you two choices. 
801 to 811 or 831 to 841. And um, but the thing is, you have I'm always there five minutes before the bus stops gets there because they allow the drivers 10 minutes to kick for traffic. But if you're there at 832 and your bus is at 831 and they're and you're not there, they'll leave. And uh, but and then um, as far as coming back home, um, I never know what time I'm going to be getting off that bar. But they do have a flex bus leaving bar at 10 after and 40 after, so it makes a big loop. So it depends on who's going where. And since I don't have a reservation, I just have to go along the people that have res reservations. And if there aren't any reservations. It's like having my own limo driver where they'll take a shortcut right to my bus stop. They don't follow the route. So, um, and that, those are really the positive things about it. And it's sort of like really a click because uh, I, I was told that the flex bus is uh, accessible, but it's such a sh small shuttle bus all the time, all the, all, I got it now. All the times that I've been riding it, there has never been anybody in a wheelchair or scooter or a walker. So I'm going to have to find out more about that because I always sit in the first or second row and I'm not sure how many rows are actually in the shuttle. So that I will find out more about. And then the, uh, the only negative that I've had is that um, if I forget the call on Sundays because um, the reservation hours are 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. at night time and then um, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekends. So if I forget to make my reservation, because usually I'm on the flex bus every Monday, and if I forget to make my reservation Sunday, I call right at 6 o'clock that morning. And, they'll get, and like I said, they'll give me two times, so um, I call and I made a res reservation on Sunday, and uh, they said they would have me picked up at 8.30 uh, to run an errand. Well, um, the thing is, if they're outside the 10 minutes and you call the number, the, the bad part is they can't locate the driver like East Bay Air Transit can. So that's one problem. So anyway, when I call, they let them know that I've been waiting here 10 minutes after my window and there's no bus. So I said, when did you make your reservation? I said, yesterday. And he said, we don't have you down. So the person that took my information <laughs> did it incorrectly. And then... Another time, this happened last week, um, that I had a reservation and uh, my shuttle never came. Oh, and one other positive thing is that uh, when I'm at a bus, you can either get a text or a phone call to let you know that uh, what time they'll be at your bus stop. So um, I had an um, 8.31 to an 8.41 pickup, and I was there, and they told me that my bus would be there at 8.45, which is good. I know that they had me, you know, they're going to pick me up. But um, the second time, um, when I had an errand to do, um, they never showed up. So they said, well, we can have a, another bus here in a half hour. So I figured I, I have to take it because I was supposed to do something in the afternoon, but I would be late, but it would be okay. So those are the only two negatives you know, that I've had about when you're making your reservation, if the person is putting in the correct reservation or not putting it at all. So anyway, um, back to the uh, uh, services, I, I, I'm really determined and um, there's about eight to ten people that we all know each other because we take it at different times and like I said, it's really um, more, um, more communication with the passengers because you're on a small shuttle and you get to know where people are going to be picked up and dropped off. So it's just, it's just all that familiarity. So um, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but if anybody has any questions. You said you said that you can make a reservation half an hour ahead of time. Oh, so it's not like an oh, advanced reservation. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Thank you for that, Devi. Um, also, you can make a reservation three weeks before your, your first reservation, you know, and also a half hour so like, say like if I'm going to go to a shopping mall and I have a feeling that I'll be done at 2.30 and if I call them at 1.45, you know, and that they'll have me um, uh, picked up around that time. So they are pretty flexible at getting you a, um, a reservation uh, within an hour of being picked up.
Yes, press the order. Did you say that they are only in the newer call? Uh, microphone, please. I have a question. I live in Contra Costa. Uh, is there any kind of a program like a pilot program like this going on in Contra Costa? Um, when I spoke to the superintendent yesterday, and he said, and I have no reason, but I'm just happy that they chose Newark and Castor Valley that um, with this pilot program, it, and it's going to end in 2018, but they're still not sure. But they're hoping that if these two cities, these two towns progress, that maybe it'll branch out. They just don't know yet. I think Roxanne doesn't live in the AC Transit area. So oh, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. You have to this find is, out from links or... Yeah, yeah. this is yeah. just um, strictly uh, AC Transit. Ray, uh, did they give you any information on how they're evaluating the program uh, as a way of determining whether it might continue or not? Well, that's why it's so vital for me to go to one of these meetings and ask these questions. And I would really appreciate any feedback from any of you because I'm not going to maybe have the right question or a more um, vital question to ask, but I will appreciate any feedback from anybody here at the center or anybody that's here just visiting the center. I would really appreciate that. And, yes. This is Preston. Now, I understood you to say, and I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. You said the only place it's what's the name of this thing? It's um, just you, it's not very sensitive. It's, yeah. it, it's only in the, the newer uh, yeah. in Castro. New York and Castro Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. I just wanted to find out. Yes, and like I said. Um, I might, I'm hoping to go to Wednesday's meeting, but if not, yeah. maybe the end of the month. But like I said, um, like I said, I'm going to make myself very visible because there's another young blind individual that I would never have met if it wasn't for the Flex Plus, you know, and he lives near me, you know. And uh, like I said, uh, other people are talking more to me. It's just like uh, Daniel was mentioning earlier, people that are sighted are, are really, uh, don't know what to say or what to ask you, but since I'm so visible on this flex bus, more and more people are asking me and they know where I'm going to be getting off and so forth and so on. Uh, Ray, I have a question, Jan. Yes, Jan. Um, I don't understand, do, do the things only go when there's reservations or can you just go to a certain bus stop at a given time yes. every hour or whenever it is? and catch the bus there if you want to. Well, uh, like I said earlier, it was formerly the 275 route, so they're really following the 275 old route that was discontinued. And um, so it, it is a fixed route, but um, like I said, if there's nobody being picked up, they'll immediately take shortcuts and get you immediately, and if there's no reservations to take you where I'm going, they'll take me very quickly to where I'm going. So that means that the people can't just go to a bus stop and expect to get picked up. They have to make reservations. Yeah, oh, uh, oh, yeah. At a bus stop, you have to make a reservation. But if you're coming back from bar, uh, you don't have to make a reservation. But the people ahead of you get it for priority because they have reservations. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Oh, one oh, more. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Encore. Encore. How much is the bus fare? It's the same price as regular fare. You can get by a day pass for, I believe, two, two ten. But uh, the regular price fixed for seniors and disabled is one ten. It used to be one oh five, but they just raised it a nickel. <laughs> yes. Any more questions? And like I said, I really, really appreciate any feedback when I go to these meetings because we all in it, and then you just never know when the next bus bus is going to come to Oakland, Berkeley, yeah. San Diego, Hayward. So, so thank you, everybody. Yeah. This is great. Thank you, Ray. Is Carol here? Is Carol Kiko here? Please come up to the table here. Uh, first of all, before I introduce Carol Kiko, who is our marvelous memory enhancement support teacher, instructor. She really does a wonderful job. And I would recommend anybody who has any memory difficulties to join the class on Thursdays from 10 to noon. And I want to first, though, acknowledge uh, the fact that Steve Mendelson, who is the chair of the California Council of Blinds Advocacy Committee, is here today. And I want to welcome you, Steve. And he is going to be participating, hopefully, in our next workshop, which will be on benefits and entitlements. Carol? Okay.
I would like to introduce Carol, who's going to talk about the non-driving public, which is much larger than just people with disabilities and paratransit. And she's going to talk about marginal transportation needs in marginal communities. Thank you. First, I want to say I pay him five dollars every time he says that. <laughs> uh, we're just going to talk briefly about transportation or the lack thereof. There's all sorts of other communities out there who do not drive. And I think it's important that we work with them. If there's a little niche who's complaining about this and a little niche complaining about that, nothing gets done or it gets done slowly. But the bigger it grows and the more they work together, the faster things happen. As Malcolm Gladwell said, it's a tipping point. And uh, so I think we should, in, should work with as many different groups. For instance, seniors don't drive, a lot of them. A lot of them don't drive and they don't get paratransit. In order to get paratransit, you have to have a doctor's note and you cannot be able to walk to the nearest bus stop, which in some places is a good mile. There's people who live in parts of Contra Costa, in Kensington, El Cerrito, which means little hills, and they live up the hill. There's like a, one or two buses that go th through there. So it's difficult to get there, and the buses start at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they stop at 6 o'clock at night. So you can't go out in the evening, you can't go out for dinner or a movie, or to visit friends and expect to get home on public transportation. And I think that's true in most areas. And there are also a lot of, as we age, a lot of people lose their ability to drive due to health problems of one kind or another. And they're, then they're, they're out there. A lot of them can get paratransit, but some of them can't. And it's still a matter of getting around. And when you don't have, you know, and we're a car society. There's not a corner grocery store. There's not a close bus stop. There's not a lot. You get in your car and you drive, especially in, West, in parts of Contra Costa. I live in El Cerrito, so I see this that you, they live up on the hill. You've got to drive all the way down the hill to get to anything. And as you age, you're in your home, you've been there for 30, 40 years, and you lose your ability to drive. You're pretty much stranded. You're at the mercy of paratransit, taxis, friends. And with the onset of technology and Uber, Lyft, um, you know, Google Maps, that sort of thing, you can, it's changing. Everything is changing. Uh, David told me that in Boston, they have an Uber or Lyft program that is a pilot program on demand for, uh, yeah. know, is it just blind or is it? No, for no, I'll, just say, I'll, I'll pair transit riders. All pair transit riders, it's $2. And the, Uber will pick you up, take you to where you're going, or Lyft, or whoever it is. And it's a pilot program, which we should have here. We should be able to do that. The, you know, the government gives AC Transit money for paratransit. They could give that just as easily to an on-demand program, where you, they could, they could, we would pay the $2 or whatever, and it would be subsidized just like it is now. It would just be a larger community. And getting back to seniors, which I know better, that a lot of them shouldn't be driving. But doctors. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> and, you know, and a lot of them will limit their driving. I don't drive at night anymore. Because you have night blindness, you can't see where you're going. But they don't say that. I just don't do that anymore. And a lot of them have had other health issues that. They shouldn't be driving, but they are. And doctors are afraid to take licenses because it, it suddenly is taking a vibrant person involved in their community and isolating them, and they're going to get sick and go downhill quickly. And you know that is not what doctors are. That's not their uh, goal in life. 
because they want people to be, stay healthy and vital. So they, they're reluctant to say, you shouldn't be driving. This also goes for people with Alzheimer's disease. There is a law, though, with that, that if a doctor diagnoses Alzheimer's disease, he must report that to the DMV. So they don't report it. You know? And with Alzheimer's, a lot of people are fine until they're not. And the story goes something like this. It's pretty typical. Well, he went to the store to buy milk and in Concord. Two hours later, he's in a fender bender in San Jose. No idea how he got there. But he went to the store and got milk every other day for oh, um, 10 years. But today, he can't do it anymore. But he's still driving. So if there was something reasonable we had that you could give up your license and know that you can get to the grocery store, to the movies, to the, a dinner engagement, a party you want to go to, and know that you have a reliable way of getting home. You pick up your phone and you call Uber or Lyft, or there should be many other agencies out there that do that. And I'm sure there's going to be more coming. And say, oh, I'd like a ride. And I'll, oh, I'll be there in five minutes, ten minutes, whatever. And for those of us, but you know, you have to have a smartphone. But now there are companies out there that if you don't have a smartphone, if you can't use a smartphone, for whatever reason, you call this number. One of the agencies is called GoGo -Go Grandparents. Another one's called Arrive. Now, uh, they charge. They charge so much a mile. If you're, you know, I think it's, I think if GoGo -Go Grandparents told me it was, 30 cents a mile or 20 cents a mile, with, uh, on to the Uber or Lyft fare. And what they do is you call them and they send you a ride. They go to whoever it is. They send you a ride. They call you back and say, your driver is driving a gray Toyota. His name is Bill. He is pulling up in front of your house now. So you know who it is, where they are, what you're getting in, you know, and, you know, they take you home. But it's, it's not, you know, and as, unless there is some kind of help, because not everybody can afford it. A friend of mine also, they are older. They are looking at giving up driving for mainly health reasons. So they live in El Cerrito, about five blocks from Bart, up the hill. So they took Lyft to the Jazz Center in Berkeley, which was, it's on University in Shattuck, basically. And it was $7. And that was two of them. When they got out of the event they went to, they didn't, they didn't think they could use their iPhone to call Lyft, so they took a cab back, <laughs> which was $15 plus tip. So, Uber and Lyft is a savings. It's not something that you're going to do every day. Oh, well, maybe it is. Some of us aren't. <laughs> you know, if you have the money. If you can afford it, it's a big deal. But, you know, if it's, it would be, if it was $7 to go, it would be $15 for this. But on the other hand, if you drive, you drive to the city and you park, you're paying $30 or $40 a day. <laughs> But so you have that uh, as Uber and Lyft, there's GoGo -Go Grandparents or Arrive or other companies, which are great, but we need more of it and we need it to be in a wider area. I know a woman who lives in Kensington who can walk to the bus stop and take her bus. She is on a very limited income. She's a senior, she's retired, doesn't make a lot of money, but so she can't afford cabs. She can't afford Uber or Lyft. Her bus starts at 8 o'clock in the morning and ends at 6.40 at night. So she has to make sure she's home by, you know, on the bus before 6.40. Or she won't make it home that night. You know, and that's a lot of people. There are also people who work for a living who maybe uh, have problems with substance abuse and go to court. And... and 
judges are reluctant to take licenses. They say, well, you can't drive, we'll, uh, we'll let you just drive to work and back. Because you take their license, and they can't get to work, then they can't pay their rent, and they're homeless. Then they've got another problem they have to deal with. But if there was a cheap, on-demand way of getting around, I think we would all benefit. And one of the things we can do to do this is all groups work together. Find somebody in some other, and I'm sure there's all sorts of niches I don't even know about that have problems with transportation and work together. It's kind of like right now there's a bill in, in the state that's stalled on uh, single-payer health insurance. And a lot of different groups came together to do that. And they've been working on it for a number of years. But it wouldn't be here now if there wasn't all sorts of different groups doing it. Because it, it's easy to ignore a small group. Oh, well, we need, uh, we need curbs cut better. Yeah, okay, that's great. We need, to, we need to get around better. Oh, okay, yeah, we'll do something about that. But if they keep hearing it from all their constituents, constituents, I can't talk, um, they're going to do something a lot faster and a lot quicker. And that's, you know, and with the technology we have, and with, you know, driverless cars coming, you, that's an excellent way of getting around. And, you, and, there, and both Lyft and Uber are also doing a thing that, for less money, if you don't mind them making two or three stops on the way to wherever they're going to take you that, you, that you can get up to four or five people in an Uber car, and so they're still making money on it, and, and you're getting to where you want to be, and so your five minutes takes five extra minutes. It's not like Paratransit, who stops in Berkeley, goes to Alameda, swings around yeah. San Leandro, and then drops you off. <laughs> four hours later. Yeah. <laughs> something to think about. Find other people outside of your particular community who have the same problem and talk about it. You know, go to, go to meetings. Like Ray is going to go to a board meeting. If he had someone who can't drive or, or senior who needs that kind of transportation to go and point up that kind of problem. Or someone who um, for, has some sort of other reason why they can't drive. They can't afford it, they don't have a car, they've never learned. I don't know, there's a lot out there. But find other people, move into other communities, and I'm sure all of you can think of something I didn't mention, of some other group that you know, somebody who needs transportation help. I think I'm done. Any questions? Any questions? Microphone's coming around. Keep your hand up for a second, and then raise your hand again when it's the, when your the next turn comes up. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Risa Gibson, and I live in the city of San Pablo. And in my area, I call the um, there's a senior um, center, um, and then they have I use their local. If you have to be a resident of San Pablo. You go to or someplace else in my area, and I pay like a woman and going back home two dollars, you know, two a uh, ticket. Sometimes I buy tickets and two dollars to get back. It's a short distance, so I don't call her transit for that. And I heard that El Cerrito and other cities have a um, similar program for the people who live in uh, those cities. Um, and that was a comment. I didn't have a specific question. I just wanted to say it's San Pablo Senior Center, 1943 Church Lane, and their number is 510-215-3090. And then you have to you know, press many different buttons on the menu to talk to different people. And that's it. Thank you. And you're right. A lot of, a lot of communities do. El Cerrito has one of those. However, they can only take people in El Cerrito. Right, no, I understand. 
Yeah, so right. which is a problem. If, yeah. you, if you, and I believe that's probably true for San Pablo. Yes. If your doctor happens to be in another city, you can't take it. In El Cerrito, there's a, um, a medical group that's in Albany. It's maybe a half a block from the El Cerrito, from the county line. So they drive up to the corner, everybody gets out, and they walk over. Oh my God. But it's the way that yeah. they give money out for transportation. This is all federal and state transportation money, and they assign it, well, you can only be in your city. Yeah. And there's no reason why on demand cannot get part of that and be able to cross the line can take you to your doctor in Albany or your pharmacy in Berkeley, you know, or whatever. But I'm, I'm very pleased that, th that you do have San Pablo, El Cerrito. Richmond has a couple of those. They have Richmond Paratransit and they have a Richmond something or other else. And I don't know about Alameda County. Any more questions? Yeah. Carol, okay. uh, Steve Mendelson, uh, two quick things. First of all, I could not agree more heartily with your view that there are all kinds of other populations, apart from the visually impaired population, who are transportation disadvantaged by reason of the inability to drive. There are people with other disabilities, there are senior citizens, as you say, there are people who are legally barred from driving for various reasons, there are people who simply don't know how to drive. We have all those kinds of constituencies. They have not been very effective in coming together uh, in a, any kind of a sustained lobbying effort. Uh, but more broadly speaking, it actually also becomes a question of health care in the following sense. There was a small study done about 20 years ago in Kansas, which showed that uh, uh, inability to drive, loss of the ability to drive, was the plurality reason for premature admission to nursing homes. Because people went downhill in just the way you're describing. Now that was done, if I recall correctly, in a rural area. Imagine how much more so this is the case in an urban area. If you could get, if somebody could get, uh, the uh, state, state uh, Medicaid agency or the Medicare program to do a pilot program of subsidizing on-demand services of that kind, I think you would find, they would find, that these savings within a relatively short period of time uh, in nursing home costs would outweigh the cost of the service. But there's no way politically in terms of the existing funding structure or uh, siloization of governmental programs to organize that. I think you're absolutely right. One of the things we've done as a society is we have compartmentalized all sorts of areas. We do it in everything. Well, that's not my job, that's his job. That's uh -huh. this. Yeah. Even your doctor, your you know, do your doctor doesn't yeah. look at all of you. Oh, well, you have to go see the surgeon, and you have to go see the internist, and you have to go see the neurologist. It's not a whole picture, a holistic picture of anything. And one, one part doesn't know what the other part's doing. You're absolutely right. And keeping us apart means that we're not going to unite and do what we really want. It's a good divide and conquer. Coalition is the secret to, to making things work. They should have a subsidy program of some sort that would cost two or three dollars like they have in Boston. Can't hear. And then the other companies in whoever. Hold on, Josie. Hey, Josie said there should be a subsidy program like they have in Boston. Yeah. And she's absolutely right. The company, you know, would pay the, the rest. That way we could travel wait, to Josie, Josie no, wait till a microphone yeah. comes. Here, 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 here she is. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I apologize for that interruption. It's just that uh, they should have a little subsidy program like that uh, all throughout the Bay Area, regardless of what distance you're, you're at and located. And uh, two, three dollars going and two, three dollars coming back. Where are you going? And have the, the, the company, whoever, just cover the rest through the state or through the county, yeah. something like that. It would be really feasible for, for the passengers. I think yeah. Steve is, is very, had a, a very good idea like that, uh, the subsidy program. They should have it like that, wherever you live, regardless of where you live. That's it. Carol? Well, this I, I, I'd like to say one more thing, just a comment. It's Gene speaking. I think the problem that I see with all this oh, stuff oh, is... Oh, hold on, Gene. Uh, we have a runner with a microphone. That's the microphone that we should use. This one stays here. Okay. So, okay. Sorry. Thank you. It's okay. It's okay, Carol. Thank you. Yeah. All right. This is Earl. I need to um, <coughs> You will. There is a tremendous stumbling block for this idea. I mean, I'm all for it. I, I took Uber to get here. 
Uh, and it should be subsidized, but the reason that this idea is dead on arrival is the fact that in the Bay Area specifically, unions are all powerful. And this will threaten the jobs of union paratransit drivers. So we talk about being organized. The unions are really organized. And they have, uh, and they have uh, you know, representatives in the state and in Washington. Excuse me, Earl, that this stuff Earl, we're going to talk about paratransit this afternoon. And I'd like to keep it there. Uh, I don't mean to cut you off. Uh, and we will talk about this because we are going to get together with unions when we start organizing folks because that's what we're going to do and we're going to talk about that later this afternoon. Okay. So I just, um, I, I, I think, a uh, Jean, Jean, I think, one, yeah. a uh, Jean, you have the mic. Roxanne here. is Roxanne's next Roxanne. and then Jean. All right, okay. Roxanne. Um, I live in Walnut Creek, Rossmore, a retirement community of almost 10,000 people. I would like to advocate for this uh, program of the idea of go-go uh, grandparents because we have a lot of drivers who should not be driving. They can't even get into the parking lot correctly. So um, there's some questions I'd like to ask about that. If you don't have an iPhone or you're not skilled with the iPhone, how do people get their credit cards registered with Lyft and Uber? and it does go go grandparents facilitate that process? Yes, yes okay, I believe good. they do. Good. And um, when you call go go grandparents, will they uh, use their computers to set up the ride for yes, you? Yes. 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 Thank you. They're expensive. Yeah. It's very <laughs> and do you have any suggestions expensive. on how I can set up an advocacy program in my community of 10,000 we'll people? We'll talk about that. The bead says we're going to talk about it this afternoon. We want to get Thank feedback you. and brainstorm. Yes, next. Thank you. Hi, um, it's Jean speaking. I'd like to say I think the problem that I see with a lot of this stuff is we talk about visibility. We talk about wanting to be seen. We talk about you know, advocacy. And the problem that I'm seeing here is there isn't enough transportation for people to be visible. So all I, all I can say is that we have to work cohesively with the various groups so that the politicians or the board directors or whoever, so that we all can work together and not have various needs where money is going to be an issue. Because the problem is and advocacy is like sometimes the politicians don't know how to vote because there's too much internal strife. And so all I'm going to say is in order to be visible and to be community engaged, there's got to be a way to be able to uh, attend the meetings. And if that means to get an on-demand program, then we really need to work hard for that. Thank you. Good point. Amen. You're absolutely <laughs> right. And there are certain things with technology that we can do. Perhaps at meetings we can use some technology that is, and I don't know what they call it, but it's kind of like a conference call or a video, you know, like a, a webinar or that sort of thing. Broadcasting and getting out to more people is one possibility. I think physically being there is better because then you can network with other people. It's always good to be right there, but if you can't, there's other things to do. Does it look like you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say that you have a uh, you have several documents, resource documents, which is really great. Uh, but the one that I want to refer you to, to is transportation document. It's a short one, and you have num a, uh, there are quite a number of phone numbers there. And one of them is the president of AC Transit's board of directors, Greg Harper. And I have tried to reach the, this lawyer for the last two months, and he has not responded. So, I would suggest, and I, give you, I gave you both his office number at AC Transit and his law office number, call and flood him with calls. That's one way to do it. And that's just with AC Transit, but we need an on-demand service that covers the entire Bay Area. We really, really do.
do. I think that's what Carol means. Because you don't go to just El Cerrito, or you just don't stay in Berkeley or Oakland. You might want to go to San Jose, or, or you might want to go to Sonoma or whatever. I, I just want to reiterate what Carol said. All people work together. Yeah, right. If we, even if we have to have a little other group of our own to do what we want to do, maybe we can form it. You know? Yeah, great. We'll talk about that when we brainstorm this afternoon. Okay, that yeah. sounds like that's right. going to be one of the topics for this Absolutely. afternoon. Oh, yes. yes, oh, yes. Are any more questions? Yes, I have. Oh, okay. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time to talk about this or this afternoon or what, but it's about AC Transit's continually changing routes and messing things up for people who use, say, the 12 here at... Uh, okay. Is that, is that going to be... Uh, yeah, okay. Preston, one of the numbers that's on your sheet is the... Uh, so-called accent, and I don't, I'm not putting her down, she's actually a very nice person, Kimberly Ridgeway. She is the Accessibility Services Specialist, or Accessible Services Specialist at AC Transit. Call, email her. Uh, a lot of you should do it. I, I know that, uh, I know that uh, Risa and Preston mentioned to me they're concerned about BART. BART is Berkeley Bard is, is a mess now because they have been working on two entrances to modernize them, which means putting a glass canopy over them and beautifying them and I don't know what else. And they've been working for over a year. And so now the escalator is totally shut off, the, yep. set, the Central Street entrance. So it means people can't find their way. So again, Bob Franklin is in charge of accessibility. His number uh, his office number and cell phone are on that sheet. His email as well. Call. Uh, you know, you, you can be polite, you can be firm, but we need people to let them know. You know, raise your voices. Be heard. You know, I hear every day, I hear people grumbling about this or that here at the East Bay Center. I don't see people really getting involved in doing something about it, and that's something that we will be talking about later. But I just want to say, the more voices they hear, go to meetings, you know, go to the board meetings, speak in public comment, write letters, uh, again, flood these people with calls. Uh, that's how we're going to create change. I called recently because, as you said, the routes were changed and the 511 number that gives information, comprehensive information, was not changed accordingly. So there was no accessibility information or anything. And I said, you know, what do we do if I call and I'm asking for departure times and it says, well, this route, the 36, there's no 36. It's, it was a new line that was added just a few months ago. Well, they changed it right away. It took them about two months to do it. But they actually did listen to me. Uh, I also told them, for instance, they have enunciators that call out the stops, right? But a lot of times, the ADA says you only have to call out major stops. So what do they do? They try to call out as few stops as possible, right? So, but I, I had suggested to them that for a blind person to be oriented, and because drivers often skip stops, you need to have at least every sixth or fifth or sixth or seventh stop called something so that you know where you are. Yes. They added a uni the university stop on the 12 line because there was absolutely no stops being called at all from Ashby onward. Um, so you can make a difference, folks. That's all I'm saying. Oh, I want to respond to what Rebecca said. Hold on. Yeah. Okay, um, I called uh, Kimberly. Um, and um, she was much more helpful than the, you know, the original number I called. And she took more time and she looked up, um, I wanted to know, you know, what, what, how, the, how I could use the 81. Yeah, yes. I didn't know it used to be the 49, but anyway, I learned from her that I could get an 81, go down to San Pablo Avenue in Ashby. And she also, I asked her, well, what side is the three on Ashby, yeah. what side is the top one? And do I have to cross San Pamela Avenue? And she looked up, you know, she looked up about three or four screens, and then she figured out I could get off the 81 San Pamela, or 
turn the corner and don't have to cross Ashby or St. Pavel and get a 72R and go all the way down to Venice Avenue in the city of San Pavel. I don't have to stop. It would take about an hour, but if for some reason if this light signal didn't work or whatever, if I couldn't get into the Ashby Park, then I'd have an alternative to go home if I didn't if I didn't have use a pair of trams at that day. Um, I haven't figured out the other way, but um, yeah. anyway, that's what she told me, and I think she's very helpful, and she'll take more time and look at more screens than the regular AC up right. person. And that's it. I'll pass this mic on to whoever. Anybody? Okay, is there, is there anybody else? Actually, uh, in, in various uh, interactions with AC Transit, almost has the suspicion that they're deliberately disinvesting in customer service. It's almost as if they don't want people to use it. That's right. If anybody, blind person or anyone else, right. for example, calls to get route information, oh, no. the uh, people who answer the phones, who I believe left her somewhere like home. Yes. Uh, I, I, I think no they're in Iowa. I think they're in Iowa. I believe to look up anything you want to right. know. I had no route information. And as a lot of that gave the times incorrectly. So they have a very fundamental problem, uh, which goes back to the fact that there isn't enough demand for an effective service. It goes back to the belief that the only people who use public transit are people who are uh, too unimportant and too effective mm -hmm. to drive, right. and who politically don't matter very much. Yeah. That's right. Any? Yeah. coming right. Okay, so I can't see, so I don't know. <laughs> This is great. Thank you, everybody. This is great again. And Steve, you read my mind. I was going to talk, talk about that. And that's why I was not getting anywhere with AC Transit mm -hmm. because some bus driver said they're in Texas. So one morning I called and said, your morning going? I said, okay. And said, well, it's storming back here. I said, where are you? And they caught what they said and they wouldn't tell me where they were. Oh, oh. Can I have it for a second? So you're reading my mind here, Steve. Actually, Ray, I believe they're in Iowa because actually I spoke to somebody and they were in Ames and we were talking about the there that I did. And then I asked them for routes and they said, well, you take the bus and then you get off at so-and-so street, whatever, and then it's a three-minute walk. And I said, wait a minute. Uh, I'm blind. Could you please tell me what that means? Well, sir, I'm looking on the map and I really don't know. And then, uh, you know, and, and she tried, but she just couldn't figure it out. So I called Kimberly Ridgeway because she keeps on referring people to customer relations. And I told her it doesn't work. And all of you need to do that too. Anyone who uses these AC Transit needs to call her and tell her it's not working. Also tell Greg Harper, you know, Chris Peep all the members of the board, you can, I didn't put all the phone numbers down, but you can get them. Uh, again, make yourself heard. I asked the other day, I said, look, I need to go south. Uh, I'm going toward Oakland. And she said, what do you mean south? I mean, you know, it, it, you know customer relations, right? I'm not, this was not Kimberly, this was just, this was the people in Iowa. So, you know, it's up to all of us. There's no south in Iowa? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> As everybody's stating, mm -hmm. you know, get involved. Yeah. Make phone calls. And David said there's cell phones. Text them. It's easy to yeah. just do a text. You don't have to wait on the phone. You just yeah. type it in or talk it in and set, push send. And, you know, and make several of them. There's, in this electronic age, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's, what, MySpace, uh, I don't know, a lot of Insta 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 Instagram. Instagram. Instagram, you can see how literate I am. <laughs> but, so there's a lot of ways to get your message out. There's also Yelp, you know, get your message out, get involved, talk to somebody. And, you know, you don't have to do everything. Do one thing. Yeah. If everybody did just one thing, then there's what, 50 people here? 50 things would get done. Okay, are we done? Are we done with questions? I'm turning it back to David. Thank you.
And this is really funny. I can't find my iPhone. <laughs> so I'm going to have to call. I've been running around. Okay, so, but it's okay. We'll just uh, deal with it. I was going to demonstrate for you, although it is kind of slow. You know, people talk about accessible buses or also, uh, you know, just being able to find out where things are located. But there's also accessible information that we're talking about. And people have said that it's very hard to get information, that, for instance, from AC Transit and, and other transportation systems. Well, I just realized a, few day, a couple of weeks ago, when I was in Louisville for, for a convention in, in 2000, they have a system that you can call and you can get information. It, it, they used spliced, what they call spliced human speech. Now they use um, synthetic speech. And it's in English and Spanish and I think a few other languages. And you call and you can get every kind of information you'd ever want. Everything from fares to general information about the services they offer to paratransit. But you can look for particular bus routes. You can get a description of every bus route. If you don't know the area, you're in a certain area. Uh, and you don't know Louisville and uh, Southern Indiana, that's what they, the, the district serves. Uh, you can listen to descriptions of the routes. You can follow the, the route. You can actually follow the route as if you were traveling. And it will tell you every bus stop on that route in order, depending on the direction that you pick. And you can get either scheduled times or estimated how do you say it, real times. In other words, uh, a lot of the times, as we know, schedules aren't always followed. So they do their best to give you both the scheduled times that are printed on the paper, the schedules, and also al alternate times if, they, if there should be delays. And I think that is wonderful, and I think that we should be pushing for something like that. And I just wanted to, to let you know about it because it's very helpful. Also, their customer service is not open on Sunday. But it means that you can get pretty much most information that you want. And I, I thought that was really great. Um, we have a, it, it's a 10 to, to 1, and it's almost time for lunch. And are our lunch servers here? Yes. So, okay. Uh, we can continue if you have any more questions. Otherwise, I thought maybe we could stop uh, right now and give them a little more time to tell us what's for lunch and to start... Passing the lunches out. Hi, well, my name is David, and I, yep. I, I'm David. kind of sighted and almost. Nation <laughs> 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 yeah. Transit yeah. has an app called Next Bus for the ones that have sight. And you can get it on your smartphone. So you can get used to time the bus is coming to the spot where you're at. It's called Next Bus. Yeah, there's next bus and there's departure times, but what you can't do is do a virtual route. You can't get the information you want, uh, like I say, the day ahead or two days ahead. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's right. You took it. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. My mic was taken away from me. <laughs> it's okay. I just want to say that you can't, that the, the, the next bus is good if you're going to do it right now. But if you want to plan your trip or the day ahead or the night before or whatever and figure out where you're going, you, you, you can't easily do that. You can get on the web if you can figure it out, but I've never been able to read the maps that they put on there. Okay, okay. sorry, David. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, then I think... Is it, is it, is it open? Yeah. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, good morning. Is it still morning? <laughs> yeah. Hello. Oh, wow. This has been really great. It really has. We've gotten a lot of great information here. And um, it's just been really great hearing from Dan Klein, Kira Kehoe, and Ray Marcus and all the other people. Really wonderful tips. So we gotta do something about it. I am a paratransit user, and I keep saying we have to come together as a group and really get some action because we can't do it just one or two people. No. We gotta do it in mass numbers. Yep. Yep. And 
Now it's almost time for our lunch, and today we're having students from Bishop O'Dowd, and it's Carol, no, I'm sorry, it's Luis and Larry Wolf's granddaughter and some of her classmates. I also believe Louise's daughter is here. Is that right? Yes, I'm here. I don't yeah. Car Carla. We have we have other I'm I'm sorry. We have other volunteers that's gonna help out with the lunch here today. And what's gonna happen or these students and the other volunteers is going to make sure you get your lunch and your beverage. So you don't have to worry about uh, trying to see if you're going to get the right thing off. They're going to bring it right to you. This is what we're about here, service. And I'd like to say that today's lunch will be vegetarian sandwiches, tuna, turkey, and beef. We are starting with the vegetarian, and we're limited on vegetarian, which would be five sandwiches. There are 10 tuna sandwiches, and 20 each of the turkey and beef. So we'll start out with 